All right. All right. We are live. So yeah. oh, we already got a comment. Gregory Castile is already in the comments. That's awesome. Well, what's up? <laughs> presentation. We're finally back. Uh, all four of us. I apologize. I've been uh, gone for a few weeks now, but I'm back. Back with the crew. Uh, Rob is joining us with us. Uh, is joining with me today. What's going on, Rob? What's going on, Maddie? What's going on, boys? What's going on, Spurs Nation? Gregory, thank you for being for being prompt. Appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate and that. And Destin, I just I was even paying attention. I just noticed the Judge Judy background. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. What's up, man? How you doing, Destin? Hey, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm being judged by Judge Judy, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be on my game today. And we, last but not least, we got Harrison from SA Spurs Talk. Harrison, I missed you. I missed writing blog, blog posts with you. I'm glad we're getting back on that. But how you doing, man? I'm good. You can go ahead and say last and least. I know my place. But, <laughs> not, right. I finally got new Wi-Fi, so I'm hoping I don't lag out like last time. <laughs> yeah, for real. Well, <laughs> we got a lot to get into this week. Um, some news recently, this is more NBA news than Spurs news, but Kyrie Irving came out and said that he does not want to return, the NBA to return. He said he's not going to return until the NBA deals with the racial issues, or not the NBA, but if you know, the USA or country as a whole. It's kind of confusing what he actually really wants in general, <laughs> but um, he has made it clear he's not coming back. It's kind of a been a polarizing issue because you got the – players like LeBron James, who's basically the face of the NBA, you know, saying he's obviously, you know, he wants to come back and everything. And then you got Dwight Howard joining. So this has been a really weird thing. And I don't know how it's going to be resolved because like the NBA can't really force Kyrie Irving to, you know, come back. And if other players are going to do the same, then it's kind of gets where it, where it gets complicated. But, you know, what do you guys think? Let's start with uh, Rob. What do you think, man? Um, I like appreciate the effort that Kyrie is is putting into this movement. He's putting in a lot of effort. I, I want to try to start off with some type of pro about about what's going on, even because it's it's hard to I think you know. And and I I honestly wish he can choose a different route, right? Because I really have just one or two thoughts on it, and it's really that <clears throat> you know Kyrie's coming out and saying that he's going to sacrifice everything, and he's willing to sacrifice everything to sit out for the cause. Right. Um, and I think that's great. That's a lot of talk, <laughs> but I feel like the NBA isn't the NFL. You know, the, the NBA doesn't need a savior. You know, the NBA is a league. That's a, that's that, pl that celebrates and the opportunity that it has to promote racial equality and just, and, and, and justice, you know, they've always backed up, whatever the player movement agenda has been. So I don't really feel like it's necessary for Kyrie to kind of go that far. Um, if he's trying to be like the Kaepernick of the NBA, one, like I said, I, the NBA doesn't need one. That's why LeBron James is like, I can play and still do whatever or whatever it is I need to do. You know, and, and if you were to ask Kaepernick in a perfect world, he would love the NFL to justify his protest and, and him taking a knee. He would love for the NFL to be cool with it. But that's never going to happen. And if it was up to him, I'm pretty sure he wishes that they were cool with it and he can still play. You know, I, I, I don't think he wants to sacrifice his career, his playing career, but he's willing to do to do that. And he doesn't have the option where Kyrie kind of does have the option. And it kind of seems a little bit premature to be like, I'm willing to sacrifice everything. And and I know maybe there's other players that feel the same way and there's players that don't. Um but my take it, it uh, on it is that it kind of feels unnecessary right now. And I wish he would use NBA and the platform that it is to do more, you know, use it, use it instead of, you know, take my ball and go home. Right, and and distracting, you know, that he called it a distraction. That's it, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a distraction away from the movement and the cause. You know, we haven't had sports on TV, and I'm not counting. You know that golf thing with Tiger and Bill Nicholson, Tom Brady, or there's like horse racing on 24/7. Like we haven't had a major sport in the United States on TV in months, and people just kind of want to get back to that. And you can have, uh, you know, the NBA return 
and continue to fight, you know, the, you know, continue to support the movement. You know, those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. And it's like you said, Rob, like use the, use this platform to your advantage. And, you know, we're, I'll get into this a little later once I hear, uh, once we hear from Harrison and Destin, but there's other players, there's, it's more than just Kyrie. And, you know, Kyrie's got plenty of money that he doesn't have to worry about. There's other players that it will impact if, you know, they decide not to return. But uh, yeah. I'll go into that in a little bit. But Destin, yeah, real, real, real quick note on that. I saw an ad today for Korean baseball. So yeah, <laughs> I think people people are are willing to watch anything right now. My friends wanted to start a horse racing podcast because they've been getting so into it. Like they're big, they're they're huge sports betters, and they've been watching so much of it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I like I feel so bad for you guys. But uh, anyway, so Destin, what's your take on this? Um. Okay, so Kyrie. Uh, he's already weird. All right, we all know that. We know that Kyrie. <laughs> is super weird now as far as me like i'm i'm concerned as a as a black male and all this all this stuff going on it's stuff that we're used to accustomed to i i'm accustomed to it the uh racism prejudice i've i've been through it and i and it does hurt and, it, and but at the same time it's encouraging seeing so many people go out there and protest and and you know do what they have to do i've done my part um not physically protesting but i've i've giving money and stuff like that like I'm, I'm trying to be active in it but the stuff that Kyrie is speaking i i don't i don't understand i was trying to get what he was trying to say where he feel like it's fishy and bringing players back i never seen the nba as okay out of all the major sports organizations the nba is probably the best when it comes to equality or or at least being active in it I, I don't get what he's trying to say. I think that he's given a little too much. Uh, what am I trying to say? I, I think it's a little too much saying that because these players play, it's going to stop the movement or slow down the movement. I think that you're giving yourself a little too much credit. If anything, if you play, it's going to push forward the movement. All these major sports outlets have been actively, you know, putting out statements and actively involved in trying to, trying to help or get, you know, legislation pushed or whatever we have to do. So I'm looking at the NBA and if you play, first off, Kyrie's not going to play anyway. So I I don't know why he even said this. It's easy for him to say that he's not going to play, but even if he did play, right. I think that it would be a good chance to every single time that they talk to you, you talk about the movement. If everybody's going to be watching it because there's still people actively trying to ignore it. You could turn off the TV. You don't have to watch it. But when you turn on the NBA, you're like, okay, I'm going to watch this to get away from all that stuff. But then even the NBA could say, hey, there's this organization you can help with. It's this that you can do. So his mindset on this was like just so out of bounds to me. And another thing is when I heard Kyrie say what he said, I said, all right, Kyrie's weird. Maybe I kind of get it. You know, I'm just going to be on the fence with whatever he's saying. I'm kind of confused. And then I knew that my feeling of the more so saying that he's way off, I knew that it was, it, it was, it was, um, I was completely right when Dwight Howard decided to come out and say something about it. And then I said, okay, all right, I'm comfortable in saying that Kyrie is off on this one because Dwight Howard talking about how he's not going to go try to get a championship and all this nonsense. Dwight Howard, I, I I, I'm not a big fan of him, but Dwight Howard, he he he's just not the guy to listen to, in my opinion, when it comes to what you're going to do in this situation when it comes to playing or not or trying to go and compete for a championship. The whole thing is just off to me. And you, we've already heard Matt Barnes come forward and say that, you know, Kyrie is full of it. Uh, we've, we've already heard Ed, Ed Davis come out and say, yeah, whatever. You guys can say that. It's easy for you to say. My my perspective is go out there and play. Muhammad Ali, he it, when he was when we were going through social injustice with Muhammad Ali days, he still went out there and fought. He used his platform for something bigger. Kyrie is just weird, and that's my take on it. I just think he's weird. But yeah, that that's that's all I got to say about it. It it was it was it was just so out of balance to me. I thought it was just weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna go you? ahead and jump in and give my take. But uh, uh <laughs> go, go ahead, man. 
See, I, I'm like, kind of like... on the same boat. I'll, I'll say first <laughs> off, uh, I saw uh, Gregory's comment uh, in the beginning. I, I did agree with that. Like, I mean, I don't – if people choose to sit out, that's their prerogative. If they want to play, they want to play. Like, I completely agree with that. I'm not going to hate on him if he sits out. But uh, my first point of contention in general is uh, – I've been seeing a lot of this this week, and it bugs me. People saying, you know, sports aren't political. Man, sports have always been political. You have some of the greatest social justice moments in terms of civil rights, especially for black people, in history coming in sports. I mean, you have Jackie Robinson. You have Jesse Owens in the Olympics. You have the Texas Western team beating the all-white Kentucky team for the national championship. Like, sports has provided kind of the battleground to make these strides. And well, yeah, if Kyrie wants to sit out, that's cool. But I also wonder, you know, everyone wants to talk about, uh, you know, well, there's players who don't make the millions and they need livelihoods. But on the flip side of that, I'm thinking, you know, if they don't play, if they sit out, they won't get paid. And, yeah, they can make it. But, you know, there's using the platform, which I agree. I think the NBA is great at helping players to use that platform. I mean, you had the I Can't Breathe shirts years ago, which is ironic because it's still – applicable today but i mean adam silver was instrumental in getting owners to allow that um and then on top of that i'm thinking you could make all that money and donate it to these organizations that support the movement that need that money to further their message and i I just think i understand his sentiment and avery bradley kind of cleared it up a little bit better he tweeted that you know it's sitting out is to bring awareness that this league does not exist without the African-American communities uh, right now. And yeah, that's absolutely true. But in some ways, I think playing and just going out with it could help the cause more. Like we said, you know, it gives them a very, very public outlet with people starving for that uh, kind of coverage to spread the message. It gives them a means of monetary resources to give to these movements Um, and it's, it's just, like you said, it's just kind of a a weird reasoning and yeah, he can, you know, play and still further this cause. And I almost think better. And and then on top of that, you're going to have a lot of conflict, uh, with this because there's guys, you mentioned Dwight Howard, but I'll mention LeBron James, like LeBron's trying to get another championship. It's the waning years of his prime here. And, you know, he's he's shooting for championship number four. A lot of people say, oh, he's got to win five to get to be the best of all time or whatever. I mean, I think he wants that. And there's a lot of older players who really want to get out there and, uh, you know, exercise their primes right now who don't want to sit out and would rather use uh, this platform to further their position. And I think it's just kind of, I don't know. I think it's kind of a, a waste if they they don't use it. You know, we so few of us have that kind of platform and he has the attention on him and it feels like he's just kind of wanting that attention to go away. And I like I said, I'll support him whatever he does. I mean, I obviously I I don't understand what he's been through, but I understand the message he wants to try to convey. I just don't quite understand his method of it. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I want to say this, too, uh, just to clear something up. I do completely agree with you when it comes to, like, if you if if you don't want to play, I totally understand. I've already said with the L.A. situation that we are going to see players not playing. I just think that if you're not playing because of the covid, the virus, I totally understand it. and I I totally support it. and and I'm with it. It's just that this particular issue. It seems like Ky- no one was saying this, and it seems like Kyrie kind of split the opinion on it, and he's sp- he split up the the uh, the just the movement just a little bit as far as people's opinions on it and how they feel about it. And I don't think I feel like it was a situation that didn't have to be split, and, and it shouldn't have been a conversation that even had to take place to begin with. And like I said, I'm totally with like like everything that I'm seeing, the protests, the the uh, uh, big chains uh, companies coming out and saying things about the situation. Like, I think this is huge and, and it's actually going forward. And I feel like something's going to happen, but at the same time, I don't think that these comments from Kyrie talking about, you know, things look fishy and, and 
all this, I, I just don't think it helps anything. I, I, I just feel like it splits us even more. And like you said, Avery Bradley, um, he did, he made a great point, just like, uh, and Ruru said as well, yeah, he, he made a great point. So, but he, he cleared it up much better, what he was trying to say. It, it was much more clear. <laughs> yeah, and, <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. But you got Harry, Corona in Florida. Uh, I actually got tested and was uh, negative, so. But, wow, you, know, you just sat me down, down. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you guys that. But, um, no, just to kind of go to your, add to your point, Harrison, I mean, for years, I mean, that's been the biggest sports have been, I think, by far and wide, the biggest and best platform for African-Americans and minority athletes in general to, you know, spread their message or to increase their influence of like whatever the case may be. And, you know, I, I think it's almost, you know, you could look at it as kind of like diminishing to the people that, you know, fought for their rights to, you know, to kind of <clears throat> to be in the position there. And, you know, the Jesse Owens and Jackie Robinsons of the world, like, you know, they kind of went through what they had to go through so that you could be in this position today. And, you know, and I think that, you know, they would want you to kind of continue to use your platform to continue to you know, obviously spread the message that, or to continue to support the movement and spread, you know, the good messages and everything like that. And I think that um, it would be a little foolish if he just, if he didn't utilize that. And, you know, obviously this is weird circumstances with the, you know, coronavirus and everything. But let's go run. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Uh, I was a little worried there. But uh, anyways, you know, I I'm totally with you guys. Like I, I think that, you know, these the NBA can return while supporting, continue to support the movement. And like you said, yeah, like once we, you know the games back get back on, everybody's gonna be watching it. Like even basketball, non basketball fans, just sports fans that want to see sports on TV. So, you know, you can put messages and continue to, you know, to support the movement. Um, during the games, you know, in commercials, during timeouts, whatever the case may be. And I think that would be a great way to do it. But, you know, Rob, do you have any uh, any more thoughts on that? Um, no, on that, I, I think I'm good. But let me talk to everyone in the chat room right now. If you guys can take a second to go down, click the like button, go down, copy the link, tweet it, share it, <coughs> share this video. Um, we appreciate your comments. We're going to keep throwing your comments on the on the screen throughout the show. But we also want to let you know that we're going to take about three or four questions after we're done talking about our next segment. Um, so if you have questions for us about the Spurs, about the NBA comeback, or about OOC in general, go ahead and kind of drop them down in the comment box below, and we'll we'll pick three or four of them out um, at the end of the show uh, to talk to you guys about. But keep throwing your comments on there. We love what we love you guys chiming in on the conversation. So uh, keep it up. We appreciate you guys. <laughs> All right, now I got him. I got him. Oh, I was muted. Dang it. Yeah, there you go. I got you. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, can't believe I let, the, let myself do that. Come on, man. Uh, Use but... your platform. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. Funny guy here. It's a funny guy. So we found out today who the Spurs will be staying with down in Orlando. Uh, according to Paul Garcia on Twitter, he tweets, though, the Spurs will play – Three of, or they will play the three teams that they're living with uh, in scrimmage games, and these teams are, well, they'll play three of the five. There was the Blazers, Kings, Pelicans, Suns, and Wizards, and so they basically based the hotel uh, room situations or living situations based on seating. So the Grand Destinino will host the Bucks, Lakers, Raptors, Clippers, Celtics, Nuggets, and the Jazz and Heat. The Grand Floridian, Floridian. Well, I don't even know. Maybe I, I could be botching that horribly, but they will host the Thunder, 76ers, Rockets, Pacers, Mavericks, Nets, Grizzlies, and Magic. And the Yacht Club will host the Blazers, Kings, Pelicans, Spurs, Suns, and Wizards. Do you guys think that like that's like the least best one? Because they uh they're they're like the worst, they're like the bottom seeds, they put them in the worst hotel. <laughs> or is it just <laughs> I don't know? I was wondering that too. <laughs> Yeah, right. Like I was, I, I saw the pictures, and it's actually really sweet where they're staying. But I was like, you know, what if it's like low key, like the worst one because they had the worst record? <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't request like the Star Wars Resort, or right? Like that. yeah. Nicer. So basically, Dude, that would have been so sick with Lonnie if we had like the Star Wars. <laughs> oh thing yeah, going, Skywalker <laughs> thing. Yeah. Well, so basically, the Spurs will be playing these three teams three of those five teams in a scrimmage um, out of the Blazers, Kings, Pelicans, Suns, and Wizards. 
So just I'll, I'll see if uh, just based off my memory, I think we went one and two against the Blazers, one and one against the Kings, one and zero oh against the Pelicans, three or two and one against the Suns, and one and one against the Wizards. Does that sound about right? Man, that was a lot so of one long. and one. That was a lot of one and ones, and yeah, yeah I, right. I, I, I probably. <laughs> so it's, like, it's it's just this this season was just so weird and i i saw a tweet i don't know if it was paul garcia or someone that like the spurs have like the best record against um a, like playoff teams out of the five teams in the western conference competing for the eighth seed and it just reminds me like yeah like they beat i remember like they beat the heat um they beat the raptors on the road they smacked the bucks um they beat the rockets they beat the clippers uh i'm trying to think who else they smack the nuggets around they smack the celtics like all these and the uh oh, i already mentioned the jazz and the thunder too is another playoff team and they beat all these playoff teams and they beat them so convincingly and then they get swept by the freaking Cavs. they get swept by the hawks they just yeah. were so inconsistent but it's like i don't like i don't have any expectations for this team like they could go and scrimmage the wizards and i would have less confidence them against the wizards than i would against like it's, the Clippers or Celtics, and it's just it, – It's playing uh, – it's, it's just playing to your competition. I mean, that's what they've been doing the whole season, just playing to your competition. That That's why you can see us beat big teams and then lose to, you know, whoever. Why do you think that is, though? Like, even last year, like, f- people thought that last year was such a disappointing season. They still won 48 games and um, had, like, the second or third best home record in the league, and they were, like, two possessions away from the Western Conference semifinals. Mm-hmm we changed a lot this year. Like people, it really isn't the same team as last year. I mean, you think about it, our best shooter was percentage wise was gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, We brought in a new big man um, as opposed to last year. I mean, we had DeJounte Murray back. We didn't have him last year. You know, Keldon saw time. He didn't play last year. Derek White's getting used to a new role. Uh, Mm -hmm. Forbes had a tough season this year, kind of being the, more of the go-to guy. DeRozan has the ball taken out of his hands more because DeJounte is in there. I mean, Aldridge is trying to be a, a stretch four and all of that. There's just a lot of stuff going on with this team that kind of affects it. And I think they just go by a night-to-night basis. And that's the problem is the good teams, uh, what separates good teams from bad is the good teams know – you can't really take any night off, even if there yeah. is a, a bad team. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, when you're struggling to put it together anyways. I think it's easy to get amped up for the big teams and then just forget to for the small ones because you're worried about other things. And, yeah, that, that's what happens with bad teams, just narratives affecting them and, and stuff like that. They, they had a they had a chip on their shoulder last year too. I mean, that was the no Kawhi year, you know, and it was it was a lot of trying to prove – uh, you know, thanks to everybody. I know DeMar DeRozan had a chip on his shoulder, which he's played basically the same since last. He's he played great. But um, I don't know if we've seen the furious DeMar DeRozan like we did when he went against, like, Toronto last year. Um, so that's one thing. Or, or Toronto this year. God dang, remember that Yeah, dunk? he did. He did. Yeah, yeah. He oh had the best God. dunk of the year. That's the thing. If he did that every game, we would be a much better team. And I, this isn't yeah. a blame DeMar thing. This is every single you know member of the team needs to have that. You know, It starts with him, though. Every game, we it starts be with him. <laughs> he's, our, he's kind of our leader. Uh, I think this year, last year was still LaMarcus Aldridge's team, but this year – he definitely got the keys, and this was his team. And, you know, when you're kind of the go-to guy and you're the established veteran, he's been an all-star, all-NBA player, I mean, the guys are going to follow your lead. And you're right, and it's, as a you know former player, like, it's so hard to come out with that same motivation that he had against the Raptors, against, you know, the you know Cleveland Cavaliers the next day, you know, whatever the case may be. It's just – there's just certain games where you're just going to have extra adrenaline and the ball is just going to roll your way a couple times. But, you know, I still think that there's like a mentality that you can still kind of go with the same, you know, um, mindset into every game where you, you don't have to be, you know, scoring 25 plus points or getting the triple double like you had last year. You know, if you go in with the mindset of like, I'm just going to give 100 percent every single time, every second I'm on the floor. Other guys will follow that. You know, the younger guys will follow that. DeJounte, Derek, Lonnie, all of them. And I'm not I'm not questioning DeMar's work ethic or his effort. It's just 
it just seemed like there was just some nights where he just kind of, you know, almost like he kind of took off a little bit. And I'm not blaming again. This isn't blame Demar, but you know, I just think if you know the best players on their team, you know, the leaders had uh, that, that kind of that mindset that you see out of the other best players in the league. That I think the younger guys would follow, follow suit more. But I mean, that's just my opinion. So if we're looking like. I mean, at the, the reason why we lost all those games against crappy teams is because we've talked about it uh, before, and I remember Harrison a long time ago saying is that we didn't have, we don't have an identity. We never figured it out. We never, we never grasped it. We never held onto it. We never built upon it. You know what I mean? So we just didn't have an identity one, and that led to us losing a lot of close games. A lot of these teams, a lot of these games that we lost to against all these crappy teams, we're in, we're in them. You know, <coughs> except for Brooklyn. You know, we're we're in them. You know, but um, we we didn't have the trust in what we were doing on the floor, and that showed because let's look at the teams that we're gonna play in the scrimmage, right? The Blazers, Kings, Pelicans, Suns, Wizards. Not that we're gonna play all of those, but we're gonna scrimmage against three of them, and then I think after that we'll have eight the eight games to try to qualify. But the but I think those eight games are gonna be against these teams anyway. You know, the, these bottom tier teams, we're, we're all these are all the teams that are trying to get into the playoffs. If if, you, if we haven't said that yet, <clears throat> um, but let's look at the Blazers. Do they have an identity? Yes. I mean, it, they, it is what it is. It's 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 Dame Lillard and, and McCullum and, and then whoever else doesn't really matter. The Kings, do they have an identity? Yes. They're young. They're athletic. They push the ball. They run a lot. They shoot. They're trying to be like, you know, Houston Rocket esque. Right. And and uh, go state warriors s they're trying at least they that's who they are uh the pelicans do they have an, an identity yes they got a young group of very talented players mixed with some very very good veteran players like jj reddick Derek favors and, and guys like that now the suns do they have an identity eh, they're kind of like there with us they have a lot of good talent in the league yeah yeah we're <laughs> front and you know what and and they and us are in the same spot fighting for this playoff spot you know, so so that that goes to show you where we're at compared to all these other teams. I think we're right there with Phoenix. Um, the Wizards, I don't really care about. I mean, they kicked our tail, I think, twice this year. Just um, one. Or once. Yeah, they, they, it was ugh, dirty, man. Davis went off on us. Um, but we're, we're not better than any of these teams, but we can be just as good as any of these teams. But with, with <clears throat> going into these th three scrimmage games, let's talk about these three scrimmage games really quick. What are we looking for out of the Spurs in these games? Obviously, we know that LaMarcus Aldridge is not going to play, and that means that Trey Lyles and Jakob are going to have to come up big, and then we're going to have to hope to see something out of either Drew Banks, Chemezi, and and uh, and Luca, right? Hopefully, we see something out of any of those three guys. Um, but are y'all are y'all taking these scrimmages? How important do you think they are? I don't know. Well, I, I think you can look at these three scrimmages and, the, and then the eight regular season games. As it, it depends on how they want to look at it. You know, Do you want to look at it as like, um, okay, we got the second chance and now we're going to use it to get back into that playoff spot. We want to keep the playoff streak alive. Like Everything we're doing is to get that streak, keep that streak alive. And <clears throat> they're just grateful for that second chance. Um, or they can look at it as, okay, we're not competing for a title. Um, this was a failure of a season. Let's just scrap it and move on to next year and maybe try to kind of get a sense of, like you said, like a, try to regain a little bit of identity, at least to try to get some momentum into next year. And I think third, the third option, which I think they should take, is and say, like, hey, like, so we're not winning a championship. We're not competing for anything here. We got – you know, five teams competing for one playoff spot, and we're like one of the last ones that has a chance to get it. Let's use this as a almost like a tryout for the young guys. You know, let's give, let's get more Dejounte Derek lineup or Dejounte and yeah, Dejounte Derek lineups. Let's get more playing time to Lonnie Walker and Keldon Johnson, Lucas Samanich. Um, I don't think Quinn Derry's with the team, but uh, Chemezi Metu and Drew he, Eubanks. He's gonna be. It's well, be, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're gonna okay. call up <coughs> Chemezi and Quinn Derry. And the, and then they moved up the roster limit to seventeen, which I think means that they they have the ability to still add 
two other players. See, that's another conversation that we can talk yeah, about they'll, is they'll if there's anyone the out there. Because he's a two-way and yeah. Yeah. be able to add another player because of Aldridge. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Eubanks and, and – uh, sorry, Eubanks and, and Quindary are coming up, right? Those are our two-way guys? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it really is going to depend on kind of how the front office and the coaching staff are looking at this second chance opportunity and what they want to do with it. You know, I will I be mad if they, I would, I hope they get the, you know, the eighth seed playoff spot. Obviously, you know, I wouldn't be mad at that, but I just don't see that happening. And, you know, for all season long, we were <clears throat> begging for, you know, an opportunity for the young players. And I wasn't necessarily begging for that, especially early on, because I was like, you know, we're winning right now. And, the veterans are probably going to be our best bet to winning. But once we started losing and losing and losing, it was just like, okay, well, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And it just felt like we could have utilized some of our players, even if it wasn't a ton, just a little bit more to kind of, you know, try to give, try to improve the athleticism on the court and just, you know, mix, you know, mix something up or shake, shake something up and just try something else. But uh, Destin, haven't heard from you in a while. What do you think? I think I think it is important uh, to have these scrimmage games. Now, as far as how much I'll take out of them, I don't know. I don't think they. I don't expect them to look good by any means. But I think it's important as far as uh, these these players not playing in a while and just having something where they can have you know full game speed. You know, get their legs underneath them. You know, don't play too hard, but you know, just warm up for the real games. Um, because I do believe that the last games are going to be tough ones. I don't think that it's going to be um, a cakewalk, even though I said, you know, LaMarcus Aldridge being gone and plenty of other players are probably going to be gone. I don't see it being a cakewalk. I, I see these teams really fighting uh, for it, especially if they went out of their way, you know, to go to Orlando to do this. Um, so it, it's it's going to be some playoff games after this scrimmage. Uh, so I do think it's very important. Um, and as far as what I want to see out of it, Man, I, I just want to see. I just want to see the players, the uh, the young players, uh, get some time. I don't know how how much time will really be given to uh, Demar Derozan and um, you know Rudy Gay and, and and those players, but I, I really do just want to see the um, the youngsters. And, and I think it's a good opportunity for Popovich. For, well, if Popovich is even there, but for our coaching staff to really decide what they're going to do in these le- this last stretch. Like, what players are they going to play? Are we going to keep doing what we were doing during the season? Or are we going to do something different? Uh, one thing that I think people are underestimating and not really thinking about is the fact that we have, when it, as bad as we've been this season, and much we can criticize the coaching staff, we still have one of the, the best coaching staff development teams in the NBA, hands down. And this time that they've taken, off i have a hard time believing that they were just chilling at their homes watching netflix i'm pretty sure they have i mean (laughs) they already said rcb already said they've been having plenty of uh chats and i'm sure other teams have as well but i guarantee you that they've been trying to figure out what they're going to do as far as uh who they're going to play what worked the best they're looking at analytics i just totally have confidence that this team will be ready once you know the the regular season hit but yeah, I think it's extremely important um, just to get your legs underneath you. Um, but if we if we go zero and three, I, I don't think anybody should take anything from that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Harrison, you brought up a good point. I remember if it was a live streamer, one of our other shows a while back, that you know, as much as we want to see the young guys kind of be unleashed uh, in the second chance, that if they're going to compete for that playoff spot, then it would probably be better to. Um, go with more familiarity and continue to play, you know, the veterans that we kind of have seen then that the players would probably benefit from that really too. But uh, I'll let you speak on that. Yeah. It's just one of those things like when you haven't played in a while, it's, I mean, as far as we know right now, they haven't really played five on five together in a long time. And obviously they're trying to build chemistry other places, but sometimes the best way to do that is just to play with people. I mean, we know each other, pretty well but uh we never play basketball together so i mean i guarantee if we got on the court the first time we don't know how we play it's gonna be hard and and you know if you're away whoever would be on my team would win i'll tell you that i'm gonna say we should uh maddie on that one (laughs) just get the ball whoever wants to win (laughs) whoever wants to win right here but uh a 2v2 ooc uh pickup game shotgun maddie (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but uh, I'm out of um, shape, man. I don't know if you want me. Man, I'm more out of shape than you are. But anyway, um, we, uh, you know, it's one of those things which just going with something that you've been doing all year can help spark that familiarity. Really, though, what I want to see out of these games, I don't care if we win. I don't care if we lose. It would be nice to make the playoffs. It is what it is. But I just want to see effort Um, because I feel like there were a lot of times, especially before this whole virus thing, where our team would just kind of they get behind a few points and they just kind of shut down. And, you know, it's on no particular person, but it's just it's like they got bogged down and losing and. You'd see guys walking up the court instead of hustling. You'd see guys giving up on, you know, defensive plays that they could have easily gotten to and affected a shot. Uh, you see guys just settling for bad shots instead of working to get the better shot. And coming out here, I kind of wanted to see them realize, yeah, we don't have to do all this on a one-on-one basis. We're a team. Let's use each other since we've all been through this, and let's kind of build that togetherness and I just want to see guys trying their hardest out there and yeah if they don't look good you know what whatever um but uh you know as as long as they are giving it their best shot that's all I can ask yeah I think I'm cool with seeing either or happen on the floor for the Spurs if we see like a mix of these veteran guys or if we don't see them at all and we see all these young guys get a lot of minutes either way we're going to be watching and either way, we're going to be doing post games for you guys. So make sure that you go to OOCSpurs.com and make sure you click on the six man subscription level membership or higher. If you want to join us for those post games and watch the game with us the way you're kind of doing right now. So make sure you go ahead and do that before this video is over. Go do it right now. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna have to put like a parental advisory tag if we're watching games live. Oh gosh! Yeah. Oh man, you have no idea. I, know I said I don't care if we win or lose, but uh, that's a loaded <laughs> statement. We're gonna be, we're gonna be watching it either way. You should have saw and me. I, that's uh, what I'm happy for games. You should have saw me at the uh, games after Game Six of the 2013 Finals. Oh my gosh! I I had to, and I was oh man, I was 2013. I was I was 15 at the time, and I was obviously living in my parents house and i had to go upstairs in my room and just throw my face because they didn't really like swearing in the house so i had to just just cuss in my pillow and all that was bad but uh i want to get into it so let's take some questions here from the comments i want to there's one earlier from gregory i wanted to talk about um our demar de rosen oh where to go our demar de rosen and lamarcus aldridge strong leaders now that's a good question because they're kind of little they're kind of opposites of each other in a way where demar is more of a vocal leader and he's kind of more of like the face and the marcus aldridge is kind of more of a behind the scenes and lead by example type of guy i'm not in the locker room so i don't really see you know how the players look up to them you know you don't really hear a whole lot of the guys talking about the marcus aldridge and how he's you know been a great leader i know Jakob kind of said having him mentor him has helped um, I'm not saying they're bad leaders. I think DeMar is definitely more of a natural born leader. <clears throat> I think he's more of a locker room type of guy and someone that I think the young guys uh, look up to. But again, I'm not in the locker room. I can't speak for them, but that's just kind of the vibe I get. And I know, I think Harrison, you said that, you know, the young guys definitely love DeMar. Um, I don't think they necessarily hate Aldridge. I don't think any of them do in particular. I just think Aldridge is just kind of more of a quiet player and you know kind of lower, more low-key in his demeanor and you know doesn't really attract a lot of noise or attention and you know there's there's more ways to lead than you know like being by than by being you know a cheerleader or like a you know michael michael jordan kobe bryant uh intense type of guy you know because we saw that from duncan but um what do you guys think um i'll, I'll go uh no i don't think they're strong leaders at all uh I, i'll say this i think off the court uh, I think that they're leaders in their communities. I think that as far as um, their image, as far as what type of people they are, I think that they are leaders. You know, it's just if you're talking basketball, because I'm pretty sure Gregory is talking about basketball. Like, are they strong basketball leaders? I I just can't. I can't. I, I can't say they are. Uh, if if you're just saying, you know, somebody that doesn't say much, that's fine. You don't have to say much to be to be a good 
basketball leader. But, you know, I've seen too many times from, from both of them that there's opportunities for them to finish games and they don't finish strong. Uh, they might have a turnover near the end or they'll have a game where, you know, they score under 10 points. And I, I just don't see that as being a leader. Um, are they are they good guys? Are they are they cool? Are they they seem like um, genuine people in their communities? Yes. Like I see DeMar DeRozan when he comes out, he talks about mental health. You know, he he tries to because I'm, I'm going to I'm actually going to school for it to get a master's in mental health counseling. And it actually does help. And, and it does a lot for me, you know, just just mentally or just going into the profession knowing that there's people that's actively trying to get it out there and not make it something where it's just, you know, in the background and no one talks about it. I think it's a big deal. Um, so yes, he's a leader in that aspect. He's a leader in, in Compton. You know, he's, he's a, he's a good guy, good role model. And same with LaMarcus Aldridge. I think both of them are, are great guys, but as far as basketball leaders, I don't see it. Uh, you know, we've seen leaders with the Spurs, so we know what a leader looks like. I just can't say with confidence that they are. Is Patty Mills a leader? Yes, but he can't, you know, he doesn't have the physical ability to just put the team on his back necessarily, but he's a leader. We know what leaders look like. Those <laughs> those two, to me, are not strong leaders, but that's yeah, my opinion I, I, on it. I really agree with you there. I was going to say, yeah, off the court, I think, yeah, uh, in the locker room, everything I hear, the guys love them. I mean, they're great human beings, but it's just one of those things with the Spurs. I don't think they've been really strong leaders, and I don't necessarily think that's through any fault of their own. I think a lot of it is, you know, Aldridge was brought in, and he never really felt like it was his team from the get. I mean, we kind of pictured him being that, but, you know, he requested a trade a couple years after. Um, you hit it right on the head, Harrison. <laughs> oh wait, did I got it there? Yeah, yeah I put, I I put the note down here. That was like uh, none of those guys feel like they have any ownership. That's exactly what I was thinking, Harrison. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we got him in free agency. He requested a trade a couple years later. We talked him out of it. He's been a great player for us, but you know, when he came in, he felt kind of short sighted because all of a sudden Kawhi Leonard was our guy and the alpha dog. And even then, I think Manu Ginobili was still kind of the leader of that team. And then DeRozan. Uh, He's been great for us. Love the guy, but it was never in his plan to come to San Antonio. Yeah, he was planning on staying in Toronto for the long haul and got blindsided and traded here. So, I mean, that has to be tough for him coming in and all of a sudden we're expecting him to lead a team. And it's guys who a lot of them he's never played with. You know, He's only ever played against. He's not familiar with it. And, you know, he doesn't want to come in and – you know, crack skulls and, and cause controversy by saying, oh, this is my team now. You know, he mm -hmm. he wants to give other guys a chance so he can see, yeah, I'm on board. And I, it's admirable in a way, but also it's just not what we need right now. We, we need somebody. And like you said, Patty's a great vocal leader on the court, but uh, a lot of times it's hard when your biggest leader is not one of your – you know, biggest role players in a game. And Patty's had a great year. But, I mean, come on. Compare Patty Mills' career to Manu Ginobili's and look what Ginobili meant to us and the rest of the guy. Or or Duncan, the, you know, our best player in franchise history. What Having somebody who can inspire others while just dominating on the court, what that does for a team's morale, it's mm -hmm. huge. So – yeah, I think they have the capability to be strong leaders. I just don't think they necessarily have been for San Antonio. No. I think that it really depends on on <clears throat> what our expectations are of those two guys. And you hit it on the head. I don't feel like either of them really have San Antonio in their hearts or enough to where they feel like this is my team and I can really – this is built for me. All that stuff was in there. But, but I do want to give them both this. I think that they're both the type of leader, like the, the type of leaders that I love in the terms of being professionals. And um, both of them are, how do you say? They're good, like they're good in the community. You know, they, they, they know how to go about their business the they're right way. They know how to of the first franchise. Yeah, well, 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 honestly, just just good representations of what an NBA player should be 
yeah. in general, you know, very, um, you know, giving back to, yeah, yeah, very giving back to the community in any ways that they can and so on and so forth. And on the court, they lead without, you know, we, we don't see it. And they lead by example. And they the way that I think that their role is in the terms of leadership on this team, like you're right, it's not, it's not to be vocal, it's not to lead, it's not to really like be that guy. It's it's more about leading by being who who you say you are by <clears throat> by performing consi- on a consistent basis, you know. So they have a lot of pressure on them to perform and to be those two guys for us. And to give them both credit for the past two years, they've been able to perform at high levels independently. <clears throat> they both been. I mean, this year. They, their their numbers kind of took a hit because DeJounte came into the mix. And so he ate a couple of their shot selections. But for the most part, they're still averaging. Last year, they both they both <coughs> averaged 20 points a game. This year, uh, I think they're averaging around 17 and 18, right? So they're both still extremely efficient. And I think as a professional organization, you know, you're going to ask different people to lead in different ways, right? And, you know... In their case, at, from from our side, outside looking in, I see how it's easy to be like, no, they don't, they don't, they're not really good leaders. But I think they are, and I, I just don't think they do it in the way that's visual to us, and and that makes us be like, oh man, well, they, he doesn't get you know pumped up or you know blah blah blah, and and we've only had them for two, like, or we've only had the combination of them both for two years, so. The leadership, it's it's. I wouldn't have put them on there. You can't ask Demar Derozan to come in year one or even year two and be like, "Hey, lead this team." It's like, who are these guys? I don't know these guys. You know, you want me to lead a team of players? I don't know. It takes time. It takes, um, it takes <coughs> the reps. And I don't know. I would disagree with y'all and say that they are good leaders. I just think that they do it in a way that's a little bit uh, hidden to all of us. I wanna. I want to address uh, Ruru's comment because she said we're being too hard. I, I'm pretty sure she was talking about uh, me and probably Harrison. Um, I, I don't. I don't think we. I don't think we are being too hard. All right. I, I'm gonna speak for myself. Let's I don't think Ruru out here one of these times so uh, she can tell us how she feels. <laughs> yeah. Like okay, this is right here. Yeah. So she basically disagrees. Uh, they're both strong. Uh, floor leaders, but they are learning because they haven't been in these certain situations. I disagree. I I think they have been in these situations. I, I don't know what situations we're talking about, but I think about LaMarcus Aldridge. I mean, he's he went to the Western. Did he go to the Western Conference Finals with us? Yep. Right? Yeah, He's he's been in that situation. I think of DeMar DeRozan, he's been in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, as far as they haven't been in these situations, they've had to be the leaders on their respective teams before. Um, as far as what I'm expecting from them, like you guys have said, I, I it's not it's not that I'm just expecting so much from them. Just from the question alone, are they strong leaders? Even before they were in San Antonio, I didn't think they were strong leaders, and and that's that's just how I felt about it. I didn't think that Lamarcus Aldridge was a strong leader. Uh, when he was with Portland, and I think that's part of what happened with them. What happened was, you know, Dame Lillard was playing great, and he couldn't, you know, figure out how to make that work with them. And it was a lot of like talking behind each other's backs. That's not a, that's not a strong leader. Um, and then when I think of Demar Derozan, yeah, he did underperform when he had to go against LeBron and LeBron's teams, and it just happened that way. And as far as them being with us, I I respected them. I love I love these two guys. It's not that I want them to go anywhere necessarily. It's just that, you know, as far as are they strong leaders with our team, I, I don't – a strong leader to me might look different to somebody else. But when I think of a strong leader, I do think of Tim Duncan. You know, I do think of Manu. I do think of Tony. I, I do think of David Robinson. You know, I, I think of those type of, of leaders who show it on the court every single night and and they they know how to speak to their team and they do all the things necessarily off their court. I think that they're leaders, but I think they're just leaders in a different section. Not not all the sections that you need to be a great leader for a basketball team. You Any can be a about? quiet leader, but you got to have rings. I mean, that's the thing. Tim Duncan could back it up because with with his hardware, you know, it's you can you know that's it's a different. Yeah. Any, yeah. Uh, 
Any last thoughts on that, Harrison? I mean, I, I'll i disagree a little bit. I think they were decent leaders with their former teams. I mean, and I, I, like I said, I still think they could be good leaders. I think a lot of it's just the situation they were thrown into. I mean, neither of them expected at this point in their careers to be in rebuilds. You know, Aldridge expected to be on a team with Kawhi Leonard, you know, at the top of the West, and DeRozan expected to be on a team with his buddy Kyle Lowry at the top of the East. And it's just, you know, you're thrown into a different situation. You know, new guys, a new team. You're not really knowing the culture of that team that you've spent, you know, almost a decade with another city getting to know that. I think that's just rough to deal with. I mean, it's like, you know, when you graduate from high school and go to college, uh, you, you know everybody at your high school. You You've got your own routine worked out. You kind of have your thing going, and then you go off to college, and you just don't know any of it, and you're playing catch-up the whole time. And I think it's hard to lead when you're playing catch-up um, and all that. So, you know, I don't slight them. I don't blame them for anything. But I think it, it's just kind of hard for them to lead. But I will give them credit. They've done a good job of trying to force the young guys into the that spotlight because I think they realize the future of this team does not revolve around them. And one thing, yeah, I think we saw a question, you know, who's a better leader? I don't know if you can pick a better one. Like we said, they have different styles. DeMar DeRozan's yeah. always been more vocal. Aldridge has always been less vocal but lead by example. And both of them have done a good job of kind of taking that back seat when they need to letting DeJounte get in there, letting Patty do his thing. Um, and then kind of stepping in when they want, but it's just a situational thing, you know, no hate, but uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to lead a group of guys that, especially in DeMar's case, this is his like second year playing with them. I mean, <laughs> after a year and a half, he's going to be the leader of men on this team. It's rough. And you, it, yeah. They're yeah. Keep so. Yeah, no, you're fine. That, I'm pretty much finished my point. It's just it's it's tough, and I I can't put all that on them. But uh, I, at the same time, you know, yeah, I don't think they've been you know incredible leaders, and and that's not necessarily their fault. So yeah, because I I mean my thing is, are they strong leaders? I when I guess when I heard the question strong, I'm thinking like you know great leaders. I don't think they're great leaders. I like even before the Spurs, I just don't. I never thought they were great leaders. I think they're good leaders. But, you know, good leaders, if you got to be the main guy, can they be on a team and win a championship? Yes. But they can't be the main guys. And I think that's part of the issue as well. Yeah. You know, on the court, I think it sways more towards DeJounte on the court. And it's it's kind of funny to say that. Like, and, and I would not say he's the leader of this team. Absolutely not. I would say if you want to talk about culture, locker room stuff, I would say Patty Mills, Rudy Gay, maybe even LaMarcus Aldridge, more behind the scenes, yeah. things like that. But when it's when they step on the floor, it's it's more DeJounte, it's more of them knowing that DeJounte has it built in him to be the leader when he's out there. Like he's the one that yeah. gets in our in our in his own teammates' face. You know, he's he's the guy that um you know will will get all over him and and or you know, he'll take Pop's message and he'll go tell the guy or whatever. He's just he's just that guy on the floor. But off the floor, it's a different story. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah this is <laughs> – maybe this is something we can talk about more next week. I feel like we could talk have, like, a whole segment on, like, leadership in the locker room and, like, who's going to be the leader of the Spurs in the years to come and who should be the leader right now and how, you know, are our leaders doing. And there's just so much we can talk about. And there's so many different definitions of leadership too. I mean – there's different styles of leadership, you know, like you yeah. had the Kobe Michael uh, way where it was just, you know, getting in guys' faces and pushing them. Then you obviously have the Tim Duncan way, which is kind of, you know, be born by example and be, a, you know, kind of a better teammate. And it's, yeah, it, like you guys said, it's tough. And, you know, one thing I'll say to Ruru's defense uh, about, you know, like uh, Lamarcus Aldridge and DeMar DeRozan is she's right. I mean, our expectations as Spurs fans are just going to be ridiculously high after the big three. You know, we had some of the best leaders and I'd argue not just NBA, but sports history, you know, with Tim Duncan and Monta Ginobili and even Tony Parker, although he wasn't the best teammate um, off the court, but uh, I digress. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it was, it's like you guys said, you know, they were kind of put in unfortunate situations. Um, I think DeMar has a little more, uh, has a bit, has a better excuse than LaMarcus Aldridge does. I mean, 
that's why I was so I was just, that was the one time I was kind of furious with him was that through the 2017 season when he demanded a trade. I was like, you were on the best second best team in the league for two years in a row. You were one of the best players. You're the second best player on said team. You've mm-hmm. been an all star and all NBA player, mm-hmm. and you're unhappy because you're not 100 appreciated with the way you're in the offense, and because Kawhi Leonard all of a sudden became a superstar. But again, that's that's a whole other subject for another day. But that's gonna just about wrap it up for us. Um, thank you to everybody who was here watching the live stream in the comments. You know how much we appreciate you guys. Uh, all your support means the world to us. We literally cannot do any of this without your support. Um, please continue to support us at ootspurs.com. Uh, as the NBA is returning, we got plenty of new stuff, new content coming your way uh, beforehand. And then once the Spurs obviously comes back, we're going to have a hell of a lot more content for you guys. We're going to be covering the games, watching the games. So I'll make sure to keep up. Uh, head to ootspurs.com, sign up for our memberships. They are now live. And we love you all. We appreciate you guys. And like I said, we can't, we literally can't do this without you. Otherwise, we'd be just four guys talking to ourselves, which, I mean, that'd be entertaining. But I mean, it's fine. Uh, it still happens a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, no, so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Rob, where can people find you? Uh, you guys find me across social media at Bucking Spurs. And you can go to Rob Trejo Jr.com. The. Uh, everything else I got going on and on on other stuff I do. Thanks for stopping by, Spurs Nation. And Destin, you are no longer Spurs Wave. You are now Clan for Spurs Clan or what? what Spurs, people... Spurs Clan. You can Spurs find Spurs. me on. You can find me on um, YouTube, Clan the Spurs Fan, Facebook, Clan the Spurs Spurs Fan, or uh, Instagram, uh, Spurs Clan or Spurs Dynasty. And last, and last. And least uh, Harrison from SA Spurs Talk. Where can people find you, man? Yeah, you can find me in the club with a bottle full of bub. No, you can find me <laughs> 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 I, def- I, I definitely hope slice. I find you in the, in the club with the bottle. Full of bub. <laughs> yeah, don't go to the club right now, guys. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on facebookcom slash San Antonio Spurs Talk, Instagram at SA Spurs Talk, and Twitter at SA Spurs Talk Twenty One. And for me, I'm a Spurs fan blog, Maddie. Maddie from Spurs fan blog. You can find our articles. We apologize. Uh, we haven't had a new article in a while. We're coming out with a, a new one soon here. This has been really busy the past month, and but we'll get new articles coming out for you guys. Obviously, you can find me at SpursFanBlog.com or on Instagram at SpursFanBlog. And once again, thank you guys for watching and tuning in and all your support. And court is adjourned. Hey, there it is. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go.